Okay, um, I, I wasn't really sure what uh, Van and Ash wanted out of this tonight, so I, I just kind of d- decided, well, um, I had some stuff that I put together for a Boston uh, developer day that we did. I'm going to run through a few of the uh, new features very quick and at a very high level, and then take a look at an open source project that we're putting together right now to bring a bunch of uh, sample code together and uh, try and uh, spread some of the, the Android-y goodness. Uh, so basically, uh, M5, uh, if anybody's heard this, by the way, or if you've all heard this, stick your hands up and I'll move on. But uh, M5 was released, uh, what, maybe a month ago now, something like that. Uh, it's the latest latest rev of the Android SDK. has a bunch of new stuff, and some of it you may not have seen. So I think probably anyone who's used it has seen the new uh, user interface for it. That's okay. Um, the new user interface, very... Uh, very well, a lot more slick looking than it was. Anyway, it's it's no longer just a placeholder, but it is still being improved. Uh, there's a bunch of new stuff uh, that I'm going to run through here in in the tooling for developers. So, uh, the first one is DDMS, which is the uh, debugging uh, and and management system uh, for Android. This has a bunch of uh, new features, but the I think probably the most important one is the ability to run multiple emulators on the same machine at the same time, and this is useful if you're developing. Uh, the kind of applications that need to work peer-to-peer or stuff like that. They can communicate with one another, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, it's also a lot more robust, and it works with Vista now. So we we got that one in there. Uh, uh, yeah. Remote debugging. Um, oh, uh, yeah, I think that's probably on the cards for um, uh, later that, that you'll be able to... Yeah, uh, using something like the XMPP service uh, to actually send messages between two uh, two emulated uh, devices. That's kind of the idea. Sorry. Uh, yeah, they can use they can do that as well if they want to. Yeah, yeah, you can uh, you can do all that stuff. Okay, so manifest editor. Um, Zav worked really hard on this. The manifest files are qu- quite complex now. They they. They govern most of the details about an application that's developed in Android. There's a lot of different options in there. This editor really helps you to kind of navigate the, uh, the shark-infested waters of many, many different options. It's, it's a great job that he did. Uh, it really makes it a lot easier. Trace view is really nice. If you haven't seen this, you can uh, enable tracing to the method level uh, in an Android application. You turn on the, the debug tracing uh, at the beginning or, or whenever you want to start capturing data. You give it a file to dump the data out into. Uh, you tell it when to end, and then you can actually grab the, the file off of the emulator and bring it up in this viewer, which then gives you a graphical depiction of where the time is being spent and uh, ways that you can... Uh, reduce your memory footprint or your CPU uh, requirements, that kind of thing. So that's pretty nice. Uh, the new ADT Eclipse plugin supports the multiple emulators now, and also uh, something that didn't work in M3, the assets packaging works correctly now in Eclipse. Uh, there's a few more things. AIDL, uh, the important reuse stuff works here now. This is the um, interface definition language for services, long running services that are created. Uh, and there's a bunch of other stuff. SD cards can be simulated up to 128 gigabytes now, uh, stuff like that. Uh, that's about it for that. The rest of this talk was all about porting, so uh, uh, that was a hot topic at the time we were doing the uh, Boston Code Day, was how to port your application between M3 and M5. So, okay. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is this Apps for Android project, which uh, it's... <laughs> we we launched the first application, so that the idea here is to bring a bunch of sample applications together under this one project. Uh, it's apps for Android on Google Code Hosting, and uh, the the idea with these is they're all sample quality or you know best practices examples of how to write Android applications. <laughs> but we didn't want to put them into the SDK because we're finding that the SDK revs too slowly for us to be able to. Uh, really improve the samples at the rate that we want to improve them at. If we have to wait for an SDK release, we can't make a bunch of changes to these and kind of, you know, react to where people want to take them, that kind of thing. And we also wanted to see if we can get, like, third-party contributors interested in that kind of thing. So this this project right now is uh, Wikinotes, which w- uh, was the application that I demonstrated a couple of months ago when I came here. Uh, that's the first one that's been released, and there'll be two more at least that will be released uh, it, it, coming up here. I think they were meant to be already, but uh, uh, all of us got 
uh, kind of busy primarily with the uh, ADC, the Android Developers Challenge, which is uh, taking quite a lot of everybody's time right now because we've had we've had good response to it. There's a lot of submissions. Now we have to figure out a fair way of getting them in front of all the judges and getting them voted on and finding the winners and that kind of thing. So there's actually some logistics to sort out. But there will be a couple more um, uh, of the uh, samples put in this. Uh, you can have a nose around in here. You can grab the source right now. Uh, you can compile it up at using the M5 SDK. Uh, you can browse through the thing. There's, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Google Code hosting, but this is all pretty standard stuff. You can dig down into the files and see the, uh, like if we go into one of the source files here, Google Android Wiki Notes. Okay, one minute warning. I'm about done. So you can get uh, information on this file and you get a nice marked up version of it. You can look at the code here, uh, rate it for ideas, that kind of thing. It's all under the Apache license, so you're uh, pretty safe to reuse any parts of it that you want to. Okay, with that, any questions? That was a really whirlwind tour, but uh, yeah. Um, we we will have so there will not be any more SDK releases until after the challenge has been uh, judged. We don't want to go through that again of saying, okay, well, there's another SDK. Who wants to try and port their application to it at the last minute? Uh, there will be uh, there will of course be more uh, releases coming, but there's no firm dates on them yet. So, uh, but yeah, keep keep an eye out. Probably there won't be much happening until after the results of the challenge are out, just because there's not enough of us to cope with doing both things in parallel. So. Yeah, I saw a hand. Yeah. Um, if you just <laughs> send me an email if you want to get on there. Um, I guess I guess to start with, uh, what is there like a uh, bug fix that you want to put on there or? Oh, this is, <laughs> that's got nothing to do with this. This project is just sample code. This is not, this is not the full Android open sourcing. So, no, 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 no. <laughs> that, would, that would be significantly bigger news if this was the whole of the uh, Android source open sourced. Now, this is just, just some sample applications that we've written that are uh, available open source. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope so. That's, that's the aim is to kind of get to, uh, Get, get some ideas in front of people and get them seeing how applications are supposed to go. Okay. All right. You're welcome. Thanks, Dick. Yeah, we have a lot to do before we get to the main event even. So uh, we have five demos lined up, so that's going to take us right up till almost 6.30. Um, uh, I'm going to go off first, and then I'm going to hand it off to the next folks. And we've got to keep these down to five minutes or less so we can get done on time. Um, so I'm going to quickly demo what I've done for this other group that we uh, we run. We run a Java user group, and it's part of a world a network of Java user groups. And we put together a map. Actually, I kind of drove this project, and we're using KML for it. And uh, it's actually a, a worldwide project. We actually have jug leaders around the world that we have one um, subversion people check into. Actually, it's CVS at Java.net. <laughs> but but it, we have one source code where they check in, and, it, and people can grab this net live. What's that? It is CVS, yeah. Well, they have Subversion too, but my pr that's a whole other story. But uh, <laughs> so I just want to do a quick demo. Um, this uh, what the cool thing about this is we did both uh, Java user groups and we did um, Java champions. So we have both this map of the world, which you can this is done in KML, but you can see it in Google Maps. You can uh, you, know, you can zoom in on certain areas into North America. Actually, if we go into United States and then zoom in here. See our local jugs. You know, there's the, the East Bay and then there's ours here. And, and we have links and w you can get to the blogs of the various jug leaders as well as their sites. And, and then we also have the uh, Champions map. Woohoo! And uh, it's all about the map. Actually, here, let's just go to uh, the United States. And where's Dick in here? Dick Wall. 
Yeah, so we have all the Java champions in there. And then um, I send those slides, but I just I'll be sending I'll be posting a link to my Java.net blog, which has a, a Java a Google Docs slide presentation that covers how this map was created. If people are interested, um, and then the last thing I just wanted to show was in Google Earth. Uh, and my map up here. Uh, here's the local map uh, with the uh, overlapped map of the Java user groups and the Java champions. And they're actually using this, uh, the Java champions are using this, so when they travel, like if they travel to Europe, they can actually see where are the local jugs that they might want to visit, and they can then contact them by, by using this. And uh, uh, yeah, so and it's all that's the same one KML map file. And I, actually what we do is we use network links per continent in each map. And so it made it really easy to do a combined continent by continent map uh, by just you just adding those combining those network links in a different KML file. So uh, if anyone's interested in doing that kind of thing, you don't have to be. There's all these things you can do with KML, which I actually don't know anything about because I'm more of a maps guy. But you can actually do some really interesting maps with the basic with like about five tags in KML. I mean, basically link and uh, you know the network link in the folder and uh, you know there's like takes like five literally <laughs> to do some really interesting hierarchical map structures like this world map. So. So I wanted to demo, and if anyone has, unless someone has a question, I'm going to hand it off to. I think Tom was going to go next. Yeah. Right. Go. So uh, my name is Tom Brown, and I started working on Google Transit um, way back when it was started as a 20% person. And one thing that I did when I was 20% was created. So one problem. So Google Transit gets its data from all these different agencies. And one problem is that agencies don't have a lot of technical resources. And we wanted them to have a way to validate that the data that they were giving us was good before uh, sending it to us. So I wrote this little basic boring old uh, Maps API thing that they could run with their data, and you can it's not. So you can click on the stop icons, and it shows you in the next departures, and find a station, and um, that's pretty much it. Um, but this gives the agent so so some errors that really pop out really obviously here is if you have a station in completely the wrong location, which is pretty common. Like they'd have one with the wrong latitude or longitude to be negative or something like that. It would be positive or negative, sign flipped. And so that was kind of handy. And this uses a Python library, so there's not actually very much mechanics of dealing with the um, transit feed files inside this um, program. And using that same library, um, we have a little thing that outputs some KML, which gives another way of visualizing this data. So you can get the same thing, which is kind of boring on its own. But then I, the thing that I think is kind of cool is if I'm trying to zoom out on this dicky little mouse. Um, so let's turn off some layers. Can you see it? Whee. So what this is, if I can. Is it this button? Yeah, there. So what I've done here is I've taken the trips, and instead of just showing a map uh, that connects the lines where the uh, trips are going, it uses the altitude to display the time. So if you look at just one of these, it's a little bit less noisy. So here you can see a BART trip going a lot. Zoom in, please. Thank you. And then if we go down like that, so you can see the slope. And if you look, um, it, there's two bits where there's a li little bit more density because the trips are more uh, close together. So that's the rush hour, and they run with a more regular trips at that time. And so there you go. That was another way that agencies can debug their data before they send it to us. And the script for generating this KML is really tiny because it uses the library. So. Um, that's all I have to show, I think. No, that was just a machine that's running it. Um, where you should go to get all this stuff 
is look for a Google Transit data feed, um, which was in one of these windows here. So yeah, we've got this um, project at, at code.google.com. And also, if you just search for Google Transit data, there's plenty of links to this site here, and there's Python code that you can download, and you can download these uh, scripts that were running these demos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. There was one more thing, which is that because all of these, um, the data is, being, is coming from a single format, and some agencies who are very cool have published their data publicly, you can take all these scripts and run them on all these agencies' different data and get these same visualizations for, like, Dallas or Austin or wherever. Hello, everybody. My name's Justin. That's Dan, and that's Dave, and we're the Ciro team. Uh, basically, Ciro is a geo broadcasting platform. We combine live and on-demand video with GPS mapping, and we love KML. So uh, it's kind of a mouthful. We're going to let the site explain itself here. I don't know if you can hear this. And I'm Dave. And this is Zero.com, the world's first geo-broadcasting platform. You're watching an archive of a live broadcast that we shot earlier from our Jeep. Zero archives your live broadcasts and stores your GPS course along with it. We're driving in Golden Gate Park to give you a little walkthrough of how Zero works. As you can see on the map to the right, we're moving along John F. Kennedy Drive towards Ocean Beach. Check out the local information under the map. Right now, we're serving a factoid about the Dutch windmill on the west end of Golden Gate Park, which we're passing as we speak. The star on the map indicates its exact location. As you're watching, you can also learn about the broadcaster and their profile below, or chat with like-minded people. We need so that's kind of a little introductory video to the site. Um, <laughs> in a nut in a nutshell, <laughs> um, so we built the whole site around mapping. It's a big emphasis on the site. The whole infrastructure is based around mapping, uh, and it allows us to do some interesting things on the profile. Uh, we want our users to be able to navigate content through the maps on the profile, and so you can kind of surf around, and each of these points here, each of these icons here, represents content on the site. So you can kind of geo-surf the site and go from one profile to the next just with a click of the mouse. And basically, uh, each profile we provide a KML feed for. So everything you upload to Ciro, you'll it'll automatically produce a KML feed so you can embed that in your blog, view it out of Google Maps, or view it out of uh, Google Earth as well. And Dan's going to talk about that. So let me just change pages here. So uh, this is an example of a KML feed. You see we got some script that people are used to, probably if you've been using Google Maps. And right here, this is what a KML feed from Ciro looks like. And this happens to be all the videos from this really great broadcaster, Craig. 
he did this trip where he uh, hiked from Mexico all the way to Canada along the Pacific Crest Trail. And so he's actually gone ahead and embedded this uh, KML feed into his map. Right now he just took off for, um, for Japan, and he's going to walk from Japan to... Uh, Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna walk the length of Japan from top to bottom. Sorry, I was watching this other thing. So let's get to his map here. But uh, so he's walking the length of Japan from north to south and uh, zeroing the whole way, which will be pretty cool. So here here's his KML feed there, and you, he just landed. Was it today, Dave? Yesterday. And he shot this video, and so now on his map that he's created on his site, all of his zero videos are available to be linked back to. Right now, Google Maps doesn't support Flash players except for YouTube, but maybe someday we can extend that into the Google Maps API. So this that also works in Google Earth. Um, and we have another Google Earth layer, which is pretty cool. If I can turn this off here, get it up. So, so these are actually all the live broadcasters right now on Sierra. Looks like there's actually three of them. If I can get this just from the top view here a little better. Um, and you can click on them. And the really neat thing is they'll actually, so there's Dave broadcasting right there. Um, so I've got a little script on my phone that taps into the KML feed here. Or it, it taps into the GPS, and some, I might need to zoom in a little more. And you can actually see this guy start moving here. So I don't know why the um, why the map isn't loading in here, but but he'll start walking a little bit. And I'm still not in close enough. Yeah. Oh, there he goes. Now he's starting to jump. Except for, of course, you can't see him. He's just floating in the ether there. But but so if you have a if you're in your car and you have GPS running or you're walking around or whatever. This gets updated automatically, so you can actually see where they're going as they're filming. Um, and we can you turn the feature off? Well, you can use you know a different broadcasting platform that. Uh, we can statically tag. Oh, you can yeah. If you don't have GPS, you can statically tag it. So actually, Dave started out statically tagging it, and I used my phone to hijack the GPS feed. So he's actually statically tagged, but I cheated. Um, so as you can see, the info window will stay open when it moves. And we took advantage of a feature in KML, uh, which are update tags. And so you can update little bits of a certain document one at a time. So basically, all we're changing here is the point of that information uh, or the point of that icon, not the entire uh, description and contents of that icon. That way, the info window stays open. It doesn't need to refresh the entire KML layer. So. Um, so yeah, and so that's available. Uh, you can go and find that on our site to check that out. Um, yeah, and so we're hoping to move forward with more KML feeds, a lot like this, uh, with you know videos and everything. So that's zero. <laughs> you're still you're still live right now. Oh yeah, <laughs> just because I closed that doesn't mean Dave's not pushing that out so. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we are informed by Alan Karuba. Columnists at USA Daily that the ultra rich are cashing in on the global warming hoax. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, oh, that's not the right page. Oh, screw it. Okay, let's go to the. All right, so. Uh, at Focus the Nation. Uh, a few months ago, I uh, was uh, talking to uh, some modelers up at UC Berkeley, and uh, we decided amongst ourselves that we're not going to listen to USA Daily. We want to see the data for ourselves. So this, what this is is uh, some good people down at Cal you're, IT2. You're being recorded. San Diego. Oh. You have to use the mic. I have to use the mic. Start over. Okay. Uh, so what we're, we've decided that um, we want to see the data for ourselves. We're not going to listen to USA Daily. Uh, down at uh, Cal IT2 San Diego, uh, some uh, the good people down there, along with uh, an excellent uh, programmer by the name of Brian Case at GISweather.org, uh, uh, is doing a little modeling. This is five kilometer resolution data from NCEP, uh, National Center for Environmental Predictions. And um, what we're looking at is a six hour space of time at five kilometer resolution. 
Uh, and I believe this one is a uh, temperature at a certain altitude. Um, go to GISweather.org. I think we're going to be seeing a little bit more of this kind of thing. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Okay. So what's the actual KML? Well, these are just uh, line strings. This is just gigs and gigs of contoured line strings. Uh, well, what there's an in KML spec, there is a time interval, and so we use a network link, and you network link to each of the uh, large contoured files uh, for each time interval. Uh, this one here, um, highly compressed, is about, uh, what is it, a, a gig? Something like that? Yeah, right. So, uh, and there's more of them. I have, um, we blew up the machines trying to load it all. <laughs> <laughs> GISweather.org. All right. Thanks very much. So we launched um, the Street View. You guys all know what Street View is? Okay, raise your hand if you don't know what Street View is. All right, sweet. Um, so Street View is how you can, like, stalk people. So what happens if you go on Google Maps and then you turn on the Street View layer... You can actually like look and see what people's homes look like. So you don't have to do the whole like hiding in the bushes thing anymore. You can virtually hide in the bushes. And then you can be like, you can email them and be like, hey, I see what you're, and you can be like, describe their window and be like, I see your yellow window. And then they get like really freaked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just took this picture of you and then you just like put in a silhouette in the window. Um, so Street View is pretty sweet. So we introduced it in Google Maps. Um, sometimes last last year here and then as soon as we introduced it the obvious question was are you gonna put it in the API so the answer as of last week is yes yes we are we just took a little bit of time to do it but the good news is as that it's really there's a whole lot of ways you can use it in the API it's a highly flexible API um, so we expect people to do all kinds of things with it include make it easier to stock people um, so here's some, so I'm just going to go through and just show some examples that we have in the documentation. So to find these, just go to the Maps API documentation, click on Demo Gallery, and then just search for Street. Um, so we get eight different examples here. So this first one just shows, it's boring, we're not going to show that one. Um, <laughs> this one is basically showing how to mimic the Google Maps layer. Okay, so the cool thing is that... Um, that you get flash errors. But um, so this is, as you can see, as we, uh, we click on the map, we've got the overlay on here. This is a tile layer overlay. Um, and then you can see the little, the little icon is turning around. So you can, like that code is all code that, uh, that I wrote in the sample. So if you want, you can use your own icon. So if you wanted to make a car, or if you wanted to like turn the street view into a girl because like the guy is sexist or something like that, you can totally do it. Um, and then you can, you know, maximize this screen. Nice. and. Uh, and check out Street View in, uh, you know, at a higher resolution here. So this is basically like if you want to mimic Google Maps exactly, um, then you can take this example, right? But then we've got some other cool examples. So Street View with driving directions. So you know we have driving directions on Google Maps. We have Street View on Google Maps, and now using the APIs, you can combine them yourself. So let's just use the default route and uh, press drive. So here, this is using the G directions class. So this will just go along and follow the route. And you can see on the thing, we've got like a little arrow indicating at what point it is in the, in the route. Um, I find it a little dizzying to look at, but uh, <laughs> besides that, it's pretty useful, right? So you can just, you can be really lazy and just sit back and you know get some food and watch what your route is gonna look like, as long as you don't mess up. Um, Huh? You could stock yourself. You could stock yourself, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's plenty of people out there to stock. I'm not sure you really have to resort to yourself. Um, so then, let's see, we also have... Uh, let's go integrated with the uh, Google bar. So the Google bar is something you can put on your map that lets you do a search for businesses. Um, so in this case, I'm going to search for pizza. And what that does is return a bunch of uh, pizza locations. And so then when I click on the info windows, this will just load in the street view for that location. 
So this makes it really easy to let users search for stuff and then preview what it looks like. And then maybe I can even look at my home right now. So, oh no, I'll do my previous home so you can't stop. All right. I actually find it works really well with homes because I've done a lot of tests with pizza versus people's addresses. Um, and I don't often actually see the pizza places, but this is definitely what my old apartment looked like. So I was right, um, right here, just FYI. Um, and then here's one more example, lazy street view. So this one is just, uh, I'm really lazy, so I always try and program things where I don't have to click many buttons. Um, so this will just do a full 360. I was trying to actually do all these different effects. Like I was trying to do like, like a randomize and then like a noise and then like a spiral. Um, but I don't really think my math was that good. So, but the thing is you could totally do it. So you could basically just have like a filter, kind of like Photoshop or Street View, which is like, you know, how many different ways can you look at a 360 degree panorama? So if I get like, if I see something interesting, I'm like, wow, that car looks really interesting. I'll just stop, zoom in, zoom back out and then keep going. So this is a good way if you're like hunting for evidence, right? If you're like a murder detective. Or... <laughs> All right, so that's, so then, uh, so that's basically the API. So you guys can start using it. Some people have already integrated. Oh, I gotta show you, this is really cool. Okay, sorry, dual maps. <laughs> um, so somebody already integrated it and compared it, um, did a Street View, Microsoft, Virtual Earth, Bird's Eye. Um, mashup to kind of compare the two and give you the best of every single world um, except for the Yahoo world uh, so here we go um, this is gonna load and here we have virtual earth bird's eye view and then we've got the street street view and then we actually have the map here right so you can see here with this little um, icon it shows you what we're actually viewing and uh, then if we want to you know move it move this car along here so you can see it moves this, it moves this, it moves this. So I think this is really cool. I mean, this is basically like how many possible ways can you look at location? Now, I guess the maybe the golden thing would be if it also opened this, like had a KML link and it would go and go to Google Earth and then like do the exact like camera view to maybe can Google Earth. But this is still pretty cool in itself. Uh, I mean, you could just do it with like a flight of view, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so somebody should uh, just take this, copy their code, and then add in the Google Earth part, and then we have everything. Um, so that's the API, so if you want to use it, just go to the reference. Um, there's a bunch of information on it. Do, 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 do. All of this, all of this, all of this. Enjoy, integrate onto your site, and Van's gonna do some announcements now. I have to do my usual thank Google for uh, letting us be here and providing the food and thank the uh, uh, Googlers with the Geo Developer ser Series for letting us join them for this particular meeting. Um, I wanted to, we had some slides up earlier, but I don't think people saw them. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, we are going to be meeting, uh, our next meeting will be Brad Newberg uh, on the topic being Google Gears. Uh, I don't have the exact date for that meeting right now because Kevin and I run both this group and the Java user group. And we normally meet first Wednesday of the month, and that's right in the middle of Java 1. So we're, we're trying to figure out, and I guess Google's got a lot of stuff going on the second week. I don't know what it is, but there's something, so we can't do it then. So we may either shift to uh, June or find another date, but um, just just know that we'll let you know as soon as we know a date for that. Um, let's see, was there anything else? I, oh, uh, Bess Ho in the back is the SD Forum Ruby SIG chair. Is that correct? Yeah, and she wanted us to announce the uh, the Ruby conference that SD Forum is hosting. Uh, it's coming up on April 18th and 19th, and there are flyers. These flyers, there's a bunch of them on the food table in the back if you're interested. And uh, did I miss anything, Kevin, for us? So I can, do I turn it over to him? Oh, I mean, I guess people know this is being recorded, so don't say anything you don't want, you know, your folks finding out or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. So I just have a couple of uh, announcements. The first one um, is, uh, probably should have done this as a lightning talk, but whatever, I don't care. Um, <laughs> there's a, uh, we've released an open source library called libcaml, 
um, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, so it's, a, it's just Google Code Project LibKML, L-I-B-K-M-L. I can, you know, spell acronyms very easily here. Um, so it's a, it's a C++ um, implementation of KML, essentially allows you to, um, to read and write KML and then dynamically, you know, dynamically use, use it in your applications. And it's also got uh, bindings for Java, Python, Ruby, Perl, PHP. Uh, there's some sample code on here. It's uh, this is an early release. It's uh, it's you know we're really putting it out to the community. We really want feedback on it. If you want to give feedback, well you can you can talk to me. <laughs> uh, you can also post about it in the KML developer uh, support group, which is just Google Groups uh, KML dash support. So uh, we're pretty excited about this. We really hope that people pick this up and start using it in their own applications. Um, it's a really uh, a really good way to sort of programmatically access the KML DOM. So uh, the other thing I wanted to do is put in another plug for Google I.O. I don't I imagine people have mentioned that. Um, but uh, uh, end of May, just put in Google I.O. because it's the 28th and 29th. It's our big developer event in, um, in San Francisco, uh, Moscone Center. It is not a free event. I think it is 300. 400 now? Okay, so I think actually early registration ends on Friday, so if you're interested. Uh, I think it's going to be a great event, and um, you know, if you have any questions about it, you can ask me about it afterwards. Uh, if you want to register for it, just search Google I.O. It's a long URL, so I can give it to you. Oh, yeah, WearCamp. Do you know the dates on WearCamp? May 17th and 18th, which will be here at Google. Um, <laughs> It's an unconference, very exciting. Uh, slumber party. P Pamela wants to have a slumber party here at Google. I don't think that's going to be allowed, but you know, we sometimes break the rules. So anyway, um, <laughs> I won't talk too much more about that. But uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, Wear Camp, which is uh, it's uh, unconference about you know location-based services, APIs, all the sorts of interesting map stuff. So. Uh, Go, yeah, just Google Wear Camp and, and you'll, uh, you'll find out about that. So, um, cool. Uh, all right, thanks. Uh, is, is it Mike up next? Okay. So if you do have a question at some point for me, I'm just doing like 10 minutes, and then for Mike Geary, the main speaker, um, just raise your hand, I guess, and Van will give you the microphone. All right. YouTube didn't have to know that. All right, cool. So I'm just going to do a brief like 10 minutes um, about Google Gadgets and Maplets and how they come together, because even internally, um, there's a lot of confusion about what a Google gadget is, what a Google map gadget is, what a Google maplet is. Uh, so hopefully we can clear that up before Mike starts talking so you can focus on you know the core of his, his discussion. So I guess we could do that. Um, so Google gadget, so how many people have actually like written a Google gadget? Okay, and how many people have actually used Google gadgets? All right, sweet. And it looks like you guys use street food more. It's, it's fine, you guys all look like stalkers. Um, <laughs> all right, so am I. It's okay. So, uh, so what is a gadget? A gadget is basically like a tiny little web page, and, and it can have various homes. The most classic home would be something like iGoogle.com, where you load in a bunch of gadgets. That's probably where you guys have used it the most. Um, and then a gadget is often personalized to you. It has stuff like user preferences. You might have a gadget that shows your most recent email addresses, that shows your favorite color, something like that, right? Um, so there, there's just it's all HTML, JavaScript. Um, it doesn't have any, you know, new technology. If you wanted, you could embed Flash in a gadget. It's just a web page, right? Um, 
And then the advantage of gadgets is that uh, you can use Google for storing the user preferences. So you don't have to set up your own server for having user preferences. You can even use Google for caching things, right? So if you want to constantly like get a feed, you can tell Google, okay, I want this feed, but cache it so you only go and get it every 20 minutes, right? So then you're being really nice to the people on the server. It's also good for your server. If you're getting images from your server, you can cache images. So you can, you're really taking advantage of the Google infrastructure, and this is because Google wants there to be good gadgets out there, but they understand that you don't, you, you know, you're going to freak out a little bit if your gadget suddenly has one million page views and your little server is like, ah! You know, so now Google is like, all right, all right, cool. So we'll give you some caching, some bandwidth, and then, you know, hopefully um, you'll develop some nice gadgets for us. Um, so it runs, you know, these gadgets, they're, they go on iGoogle.com. You can also embed them via a script tag just on any web page. Uh, the thing there is that, you know, you don't have user preferences because the user visiting your web page, it doesn't go and try and detect their uh, Gmail login or anything. But oftentimes you might have a gadget that just is a game or shows like recent feeds. And that's the kind of thing that's useful to embed on a web page or like a utility, like a. I was at a gadgets competition last weekend, and somebody made a cryptography utility. So in case you always find yourself needing to encrypt and decrypt stuff, you could stick that on a useful web page for you. What type of um, it, they had a, it had a bunch of names. I think Caesar was one of them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this was for a, a college competition. Um, uh, Georgia. Georgia? Pretty much Georgia. All right, so and then the other thing is that you can submit your gadget to a directory, and that's kind of like free publicity. So if your gadget's popular, people find it in the directory and they search for it. Um, so here's just a demo, or a slight Hello World example, basically. Um, so the first one, uh, there's two different content types you can have. So you can see it's wrapped, it's basically a web page that's wrapped in some XML, which gives kind of meta information about the gadget. Uh, um, so we have this modules, the root tag, and then this is very basic meta information, which is the title. So this is the title that's displayed on the gadget when you load it onto a page. Other meta information is like author, author email, uh, descriptions, screenshot, thumbnail, the stuff that lets it be included in directory. So this is really nice because it makes it easy, like easy for us to identify who are the authors of gadgets. So you can go and like look at the top gadget authors directory, and it just does it based on all this meta information that's here. Uh, the other stuff that goes in here is like the user preferences, defining the user preferences, localization, if you want to define different message, uh, message strings for different locales. Um, so here we have, once we have this, we have the content tag, and that's basically where all of your uh, stuff goes. You can think of it as like the body of a web page. So basically, you could write something as if it was all in the body of a web page, and then you could just copy and paste that into a gadget, and it should work. Um, you can also do content type equals URL if you just want it basically to load in um, a URL that's running on your server. Uh, here's just an example of the user preferences. So this is, I'm sure you've seen the UI. You know, you can do this drop down, edit settings, and you can say what the user preferences are. If you want, you can also programmatically set user preferences from the gadget. And then you can see this is all defined in the, um, in the module. So we have user pref name, uh, if it's required, default value. Uh, then we have like an enum, with, which is a drop down, if you want to have that type of user preference. And then you can just go access these user preferences. So the things to use this for are like, what is, what's the default information that a user wants to see? I use it when I make a game gadget to remember like what the high score is, because you can actually have a hidden user preference. Um, so I say, OK, set this hidden user preference to their new high score. So then every time they log in, they see their high score, and they try and compete against it, et cetera. So it's really cool, because you don't have to set up your own database on your server to remember the high scores of all these millions of users. I don't have millions of users, though. Since it's a gear, since it's a gear, am I talking to the SQLite one, or am I talking to it on the API? We're, this is just all stored on the gadget server. Right, right. Which is what? Uh, which is their own implementation. <laughs> oh, okay. It's not exposed to you. I mean, you just get Java. Everything is done via JavaScript API. Okay. So you get JavaScript functions for accessing this stuff. So you can see it's prefs .get string name prefs .get in high score, right? Um, the other cool thing is that. Uh, the Gadgets API comes with its own functions for using this iGoogle proxy that will go out and get a feed or get HTML or get text or get XML and then return it to you. So the basic point of this is that usually in a web page, you're restricted to only getting files via XML HTTP requests that are on your own domain. You're not restricted to that anymore with Gadgets because you can use these functions that are allowed to get it from any publicly available domain. 
So this is really cool because you don't have that headache where you're like, oh god, now I have to set up a proxy, blah, blah, blah. You can get stuff from anywhere. Um, and the other cool thing about these functions is that they have the ability to set like how much you're going to cache it. So you say, okay, get this feed and then only cache it you know, every 20 minutes, every 5 seconds, whatever you want to do. So it's a very smart proxy. Um, Gadgets API, you can also, there's just some features, some nice little UI features that they built in that are common. The tabs is definitely the most common. The point of gadgets, they're very small, right? So how do you fit a lot of information inside a small amount of space? One way is to do tabs, right? So you say, this is the main tab, this is my configuration tab, et cetera. A good thing to do is remember what's the, what's the last tab that my user was on, because that's probably their favorite one, right? So the tabs is probably the most used library. Um, there's a couple ones that make it easy to do games, so there's a drag and a grid. Uh, and then mini messages is just for you know displaying little messages, which is a common thing for gadgets. Um, all right, so let's, I just want to show some examples. Um, so using gadgets with the Maps API, there's not, there's, I mean, as I said, gadgets are really just little web pages, so there's not really a big difference there. There are a few caveats. Everybody already always asks, okay, where, where do I register my API key for? Um, since gadgets are served from gmodules.com, you register for that domain, okay? That's probably the thing that people get hung up on the most. The other thing is that gadgets, a lot of times, um, there might be multiple gadgets on a page, so you don't want your gadget to take 10 minutes to load, right? Because that's really sad for the user because the user is sitting there. Like, so on my iGoogle, I actually have one tab that has nothing on it, and that's my default tab, and then all my other tabs have stuff on it because I'm scared of, like, loading the page and re realizing I have, like, you know, some gadget that I'm debugging on it or whatever. So, um, so if you want to be kind to your users, we just launched a static maps API, which is just maps as images. So if you want to be kind to your users, start off with a static map API, wait for some user interaction, and then load in the JavaScript maps API. That's a little tip. We ended up doing that with our map search gadget. If any of you guys have that on your page, you may not notice, but it actually does um, a very quick transition from static to dynamic API. I think it actually fades. It's very pretty. Um, so here, let me show some examples. Uh, where's my iGoogle? All right, so here is an earthquake watch. Um, and it looks like there's a big one in Oregon. Oh, good, that's not us. All right, good. And uh, it looks like it sucks to be in Asia because we've got some big ones over there. And Japan's doing okay, so your friend <coughs> is uh, having a fine walk through Japan. Um, this is a clouds gadget. This just shows you the current clouds. <coughs> it's just really pretty. <laughs> and then here's the map search gadget I was talking about. This is already loaded in the dynamic map. Um, but if I reloaded, you might be able to see the transition. And this is just using the Ajax search API um, to let you search for stuff. Um, but I think it's one of the, probably the most common, uh, commonly used map gadgets. Um, so you can always like look at the code for these uh, if you want to see how it's done. But it's, uh, it's basically like how you do for a web page. So then we get to some variations on gadgets, right? So, because um, gadgets, like, you know, we developed this gadgets format, and then we realized there are all these other things that it would be useful to use the gadgets format for. So some examples, um, recently we came up with gadget ads. So that's basically like we're trying to bring back the annoying ads um, that have flashiness in them. And, but this time we're bringing it back via gadgets. So, you know, before we had text ads and maybe some, um, you know, we've got some special ads on maps. Um, but people, you know, they get kind of tired of just seeing text all the time, right? And just only having their ad be text. And they want to, like, let the user have, like, richer interaction and actually maybe preview some merchandise, right? Um, so we could have come up with all these custom ways for them to do different types of ads. But they're like, well, why don't we just use the Gadget API? Because the Gadget API, they can go write it, and uh, then we, we'll be able to run it anywhere, basically. Um, and then it gets to take advantage of all those features that are especially really important for gadget ads. Think about caching, right? If a gadget ad is you know, seen on a lot of pages at once, it's really important to not be using resources too much. Um, so then we recently launched the Visualization API, and that has gadgets along with it. So the Visualization API, visualization API is for getting um, basically tabular data from a data source. And right now they're started with Google Spreadsheets. And then they have a JavaScript API for easily reading that into uh, a gadget or a web page. And it's basically like get rows, get columns, stuff like that. You can even do pivots. And um, for the gadgets part of this, and the gadgets, the cool thing about the gadgets is they both run in spreadsheets.google.com and they also run on a web page or in iGoogle. And they don't, um, all they do is load a visualization JavaScript API and then define this user preference, um, which defines the data source, which in this case is a spreadsheet. 
And uh, see, some of these, I have this require feature. That's something that's in the module preferences um, and is required by some of these, which basically loads in another library. Social gadgets, I'm sure you guys have all heard of Open Social. And they're also using the Gadgets API. And in this case, you just have to do this require feature equals Open Social. And then you get access to all of these special social functions. And this will, these will work in social networks that implement Open Social. Um, probably best examples right now are Orca and High Five. Um, but there's more and more coming up. And then we have maplets, which we're talking about today. And here you have to do require feature equals share map. These, what they do, they only load in maps.google.com. And this share map feature means that every maplet has access to the main Google map there. And so you basically do all these operations on that main map. So you can load multiple maplets at a time, and they'll all be able to be loaded onto that map at a time. And this is basically us trying to make it easier to combine mashups, because you know you're looking at like the Chicago crime mashup, and then you're looking at like housing maps mashup, and you're like, oh, I wish I could know how much crime there was in this neighborhood. Um, so here you can if you go to Google Maps and you load in the housing, and then you load in the crime, and then you load it at the same time. Um, and so this uses the Maps API, but a special version of it, um, because we had to make some changes to it because of the fact that it uh, has to go through some security to get to that main map. And uh, that's called the Maplets API. And Mike is going to talk about some of the differences coming up. And I'll just show you some examples of Maplets, so you get a good idea of what those are. So how many people have actually used Maplets? All right, so you get that half of the room. All right, so let's go through some examples. So if you want to use Maplets, you just have to sign in to maps.google.com and then go to the My Maps tab. And then you can do Browse the Directory, and that'll bring you to a directory just like the Gadgets directory. And then you can load stuff on. I already have a bunch of Maplets, so we'll just go through a couple of them here. Um, so actually, let's do the Maplet Scratch Pad. So this is actually if you just want to do a Maplet on the fly. So let's do, does anyone know our latitude longitude here? Probably not, OK. <laughs> Worth shot. All right, G tug in the house. All right, so here we can do. We'll just do a maplet on the fly. So here we go. That just created a marker on the map and said G tug in the house. So if you just look at this, all this is is module, a bunch of preferences, require feature equals shared map, and then what looks basically like Maps API calls. All right, so there's that. Um, let's look at. So US address lookup, this is cool because uh, this is reverse geocoding. And reverse geocoding is a process of taking a latitude longitude and turning it into an address. And this is something we don't do from the Google Maps bar right now. So it's a great thing to have as additional functionality. So here I'll click here, and it told me that was Ellsworth, nah. I don't know what state nah is. Nebraska. Nebraska. <laughs> and then you guys remember that, uh, that map gadget we had before with the clouds? So the cool thing is, is that um, I, I just took that and made it into a maplet um, because I wanted to be able to see clouds at the same time as you know looking at crime, um, so I could see if like clouds influenced crime rate. And so here we go. This is just okay. loaded onto the map, and this is actually only two lines of code for this maplet. So that's pretty cool. It's really easy to load tile layer overlays onto these maps. Um, oh, sky! I also wanted to be able to see sky, so I could correlate sky to crime. So I took the sky maps and just loaded them in. They really don't make any sense at all on here, but I thought it was funny. Um, what is this one? I need a bathroom. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> oh, this is really cool. This is 360 cities. Um, they do panoramas. So I'll load in um, Antwerp. Yeah. <laughs> We apparently have a big fan of Antwerp. So this is cool. This is um, panoramas. And so then you can just browse these cities virtually. It's basically like Street View, but a little bit, a little bit cooler. And yeah, so I think you basically get the idea of like what, you know, what maplets are. And uh, I think we can turn it over to Mike now to get into our election map. 